Uh, Joshua chapter 5, verse number 13. If you found your place with me, say amen. amen. It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. I like the last four words of the text. And Joshua did so. I wish you'd pray with me and for me and, and pray for yourself tonight that the Lord would speak to you, all right? God, we thank you so much for the good, sweet things our ears have heard and our hearts have experienced, not just in this service, but the preceding services before this. God, it's been real good to be here. I feel like we've just sat in heavenly places this week in Christ. And God, no doubt, uh, you've got something else for us tonight and something more for these people uh, in the days and weeks to come. Lord, Lord, I, I, I don't know how long you'll decide to keep uh, the meetings going in the pastor's heart, but Lord, I pray that you would continue just to pour out your blessings on this place. God, I pray that you'd bless them with souls for the labor. I pray, God, that you'd give them uh, power in these days, encourage them, edify the church, and may they exalt the Lord Jesus Christ with their very existence here. God, I pray tonight you'd help me to preach now. I realize I can't do nothing apart from you, and I need you. And Lord, I pray that you'd help me tonight. We've been helped with the singing, and I pray the preaching would do nothing less than that. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Um, tonight we're going to examine one of the greatest military leaders that's ever lived. Um, in my own personal leisure reading, when I'm not reading my Bible or not studying or reading some spiritual book to help me in the Scriptures, uh, when I'm just doing my normal leisure reading, generally anybody that knows me knows that you'll find me reading some type of military history, whether that be medieval military history right up into frontier history, the Civil War, the Revolutionary War before that, and right up to today with Navy SEALs and Rangers. I I, I like that stuff. I love to read true stories of heroism, uh, true stories of men that sacrificed everything on the battlefield and leadership qualities that these men have. And this man we're looking at, this man Joshua, he is one of the greatest military leaders, bar none, whatever era, whatever age you want to throw out. He's one of the greatest military minds that God ever put on planet Earth and that ever wore shoe leather and ever strapped a weapon on and walked on to the battlefield. I tell you what a great military mind he is. He's such a great military mind that during the days of the Civil War, great generals like General Robert E. Lee and General Stonewall Jack and such as that, uh, inside joke there. Anyways, they would uh, they, they literally consulted the Old Testament and would read about the battlefield tactics of Joshua to get a better uh, desire and to learn more of how to beat the enemies that they would fight. They even said, as, as messed up as this guy was in his ideology, we know he was messed up, but they said even Hitler, the great military mind he was, that he instructed his generals to read about Joshua to better understand battle field tactics and even today I've read that at West Point where some of the finest most brilliant military minds study today at West Point they still study some of the battlefield tactics of Joshua even in 2020 I'd say he's one of the greatest military men that's ever lived and he's on the eve he is on the verge he's right on the cusp of the battle that his name will forever be inseparably tied to. When you think Joshua, you think the battle of Jericho. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. We, we've sung about it in Sunday school and we've taught about it to the kids and we've heard about it preached. And anytime you think Joshua, you can't help but think about Jericho. And everybody knows about Jericho, but the three verses I've read to you tonight is the night before the siege of Jericho commenced 
advances and gets underway. Joshua's on the verge of this great battle. And like any great military leader, uh, the night before the battle, he is getting as close to his objective as he possibly can, and he's surveying what he's up against. The Bible said he was standing over against Jericho. He's got as close to these walls as he can in the night, and he's looking at them. And I imagine in his heart and his mind, he's trying to get an idea how the battle's going to go down. I imagine in Joshua's mind, he's thinking, well, I'll probably need uh, uh, this many ladders to scale the wall. I'll need a battering ram to knock down the door. I'll need so many archers to keep their archers from shooting our men uh, while they're scaling the wall. He's getting all this stuff in his mind while he's looking at it. Little does Joshua know, God has already gone before him and God has already done all the scouting that needs to be done. Uh, let me just pause right there and say this. God don't need your help in whooping Jericho. You need God's help in whooping Jericho tonight. Uh, God can get it done without me tonight. I found, I found this out, and, and to my flesh, this hurts my feelings, but it's just a God's honest truth. I found out that if tonight I set my Bible down, quit on God, walked away from my church, left my family, and just shipwreck myself for the rest of my existence on planet Earth, God will have somebody else in my shoe leather preaching a King James Bible tomorrow night at Bible Missionary Baptist Church, and the plan and the program of God will keep right on rolling without me. God don't need me, but I need God with everything that I am tonight, friend. And so here we find Joshua's out scouting Jericho. God ain't scouting Jericho. God's scouting Joshua. Listen to me tonight, y'all. God is more interested in men than he is the mountains that the men climb. God's more interested in the saint than he is in the storm the saint is going through tonight. God's more interested in Joshua than he is the Jericho that stands in front of Joshua tonight. And God's going to let Joshua get the victory. It's going to happen. We know that. He's going to get the victory. But I want y'all to understand something. Before God knocks down walls in front of Joshua, he's showing up to knock down some walls inside of Joshua. Before God ever starts knocking down walls in front of you, He'll get you apart and start knocking down walls in you before He can use you to knock down some walls outside of you tonight. Just pause right there and say, that's the reason why a lot of Christians don't see real victory in their life and they quit somewhere along the way is they want God to do things outwardly where everybody can see it, but they ain't never spent secret time with God and spent that time by the brook Cherith where God can knock some things down in them before God uses them to knock things down outside of them tonight. Here we find God's going to show up. God shows up here. These three verses, we'll look at this individual that shows up more in a minute and highlight him, but suffice it to say, God shows up. You say, what's the Lord showing up for right here? Well, I believe he's showing up uh, to let Joshua know you are not alone in your battle. <laughs> You'll find this is the first time that God has shown up bodily to Joshua. Now God has shown up to Moses, but God ain't never shown up like this to Joshua before. He spoke to him, but he ain't never showed up like this. Let me say this tonight. I think God has shown up to let Joshua know, Joshua, your man of God may be gone. Moses may be gone. The man who you look to for your instruction and your orders, he may be gone. But Moses, I want you to know something. I have not left. I am still here. And I am still the same yesterday, today, and forever. And y'all listen to me, you young people in the house understand this. There may come a day when the man or the woman of God that God has put in your life may be gone. Your mentor may be gone. There may be a day when they pass off the scene, die and go to heaven. But you mark this down. The God of that man and the God of that woman will not draw a life's breath, die and walk out on you. He'll always be there tonight. And I want you to notice, this is what I'm preaching on tonight. Look at what the Bible says. As soon as, 
As Joshua's surveying this walls, he don't know who this is that showed up. The Bible said he's looking, and all of a sudden there stands a man over against him with a sword, Brother Foster, in his hand. This man is already in an offensive position. His sword is unsheathed. It's in his hand by his side. And immediately, Joshua being the soldier that he is, I mean, this, Joshua ain't no newbie to war. He's been fighting wars for 40 years under the command of Moses. Joshua sees this man, I see his hair stands up on the back of his neck, squares his shoulders up, and he walks over to him and he said, I just got one question for you, Jack, just one, because this is going to determine how the rest of our little interaction is going to go here. And he says in verse 13, the last clause of the verse, he says unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? Whose side you on? Because that's going to determine how the rest of our interaction is going to go. Uh, you know, you all of a sudden come out with, well, I'm for the Jericho, I'm for Jericho. We think it's fixing to go down right here, brother. So you need to identify your colors plain and clear. Now, I want you all to understand something about this question. <laughs> understand something about this question. Aren't thou for us or for our adversaries? This is not a yes or a no question. Right. Does everybody understand that tonight? Yeah. Hey, yes or no question. If I walk up to you and I say, hey, Brother Sam, are you for me or are you for Brother Cody? And you say, yeah. Yeah, you would say Brother Cody and it would be one of us. <laughs> are you for me or for Caleb? You say, yeah. Well, yeah, what? Yeah, you for me or yeah, you for Caleb? If I say, are you for me or are you for Caleb? You say, no. Well, no what? No, you're not for me or no, you're not for Caleb. This, this is not a yes or a no question. But I want you to notice how the captain of the Lord's host answers Joshua's question. Are thou for us or for our adversaries? Verse 14. And he said, nay. No. So what's he saying? He's saying this. I didn't come to take sides. I came to take over. I ain't for neither one of you. I ain't on your side, I ain't on their side. I have come on heaven's interest tonight, and if you want to see some walls fall down, it ain't time for me to join up with you. It's time for you to join up with me. Can I say the problem with Joshua, the problem with Joshua is the problem that a lot of independent, fundamental, premillennial, King James, Bible believe in, walk right, talk right, don't cuss, drink, chew, and run with them that do, hacking, shouting, spitting, Baptists got tonight. It's the same problem a lot of Baptists got. They want God to throw in with them. May I say God's not interested in throwing in with you. God's program already works. God's power's already established. God's plan's already laid out. God's not looking to jump in on your side. He's looking for you to join up on his side tonight. So I'm preaching on this thought for a few minutes. I'm preaching on he didn't come to take sides. He came to take over. He didn't come to take sides. I remember some years ago, I was probably my son's age, somewhere along in there, and I remember that there was a slogan that went around and it just swept uh, swept all of Christendom, if you will. Christendom, that's just a real loose liberal term. But I mean, it was, everybody had it. And it was wristbands, and it was t-shirts, and it was bumper stickers, and it was license plate holders, and I mean, it was necklaces, and, and it just went everywhere. And uh, I mean, everybody had them. Baptists had them, Pentecostals had them, Methodists had them, Presbyterians had them, Catholics had them, Church of God, Church of Christ. I mean, just Everybody had them. And it said this. It simply said, it simply said God is my co-pilot. How many of y'all remember that when it got real popular? Kind of like WWJD. God is my co-pilot tonight. And I remember seeing those things and just something about that just never registered real well with me. Now, now you may have one on your car out there right now. I didn't walk through the parking lot to see. If you do, I have no idea. I'm just going to preach it because this, this is what I got here. And so I, it, it, God's my co-pilot. And something about that just never registered me. Maybe it's because I am a pilot, have been since I was 18 years old, and I grew up the cockpit of an airplane, I know what the co-pilot does. The job of the co-pilot is he gets in and he sits down if it's a side-by-side, -side, he sits in the right seat, which is the dummy seat, and he sits there and he don't touch the yoke, 
He don't touch the throttle. He don't touch the mixture. He don't mess with the trim. He don't handle the radio. He don't touch the rudders. He doesn't do nothing unless he is given explicit instructions by the PIC, the pilot in command, to do so. If the pilot in command doesn't give him any orders, then it's his job to get in, sit down, shut up, hold on, and just wait for the ride to be over with. It's not his job to open his mouth and do nothing but just to be the co-pilot to the pilot in command. Now let me say this to all y'all tonight. God is not the least bit interested in being your stinking co-pilot. God is not the least bit interested in getting in your life, sitting down, shutting up, holding on, and letting you work everything. That is not God's interest. God's interest is He wants you to get in you to sit down, you to shut up, and you to take orders and let God do what He wants to do in your life. Most of the time what we want is we want to control everything until we've messed it all up and got out of control. God, you take it. Now that I've got it all messed up, how about you take it? How about you get out the, how about you get out the left seat and get in the right seat and let God sit in the seat He belongs in tonight? and let him pilot the ship. He didn't come to take sides. He came to take over. So you sit here tonight and you say, Preacher, I want the Lord to take over my life. I don't want him to have to do a hostile takeover. I'm willingly giving the reins of my life to him. I'm willingly giving the throne of my heart to him. Lord, I want you to take over. How, how can we see the Lord take over in our life. Well, I see three things out of this text that I want to throw out to you real quick and we'll be done. Let me say number one, if you're to see the Lord take over in your life, firstly, there must be a relinquishing of the command. There must be a relinquishing of the command. Watch verse 14 with me. Look what your Bible said here. Uh, the, the captain of the Lord's host says, Nay, but it's captain of the host of the Lord of mine now come. And watch what Joshua does. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, Watch what he says. What saith my Lord unto his, watch the word, servant. Servant? Servant? Brother Foster Joshua ain't no servant. Servant implies the lowest man on the totem pole. Servant implies the waiter, the lackey boy that comes up and cleans the table off after everybody else has got done eating. Servant implies the lowest man in the room. That ain't Joshua. That ain't Joshua. Y'all realize Joshua has just been given the charge of well over a million people. Over 600,000 Soldiers, Joshua's just taking the command of, not including the women and the children and the elderly. Well over a million people. Moses is dead. Joshua's the head man on campus, brother. He's the chief in charge. And when he walks through the camp, people slap their heels together, throw their hands up, and say, Yes, sir, Mr. Joshua. What do we do? When do we go? What's God's orders? What do we do? What do you say? I mean, Joshua ain't no servant, he's the leader. But when he gets in the presence of God, he says, God, I'm no leader. God, I'm no king. I'm no ruler. I'm no general. God, I'm just your lowly servant. Now I'll say this to you. Uh, point number one is going to knock a whole lot of us out while we'll never see God take over. I mean, the truth is, for some of you, you might as well just go ahead and shut your Bible, doodle around on your phone, and just just disregard the rest of the message because the rest of the message won't help you if you can't get past point number one. If you can't ever get to the place where you're willing to relinquish the command of your life to somebody else, then we might as well just stop right here because you ain't going no farther. You, you say, no, preacher, I, I, I'm all in on this thing right here. Really? You can't even relinquish the command at church to the pastor. You can't even relinquish command, ma'am. Ma'am, at home, you can't even relinquish command to the head over you, your husband. S children, you can't even relinquish the command uh, to your mama and your daddy. And you going to tell me that you can't respect the authority that you have seen that God's put in your life, but you're going to respect authority that you have not seen? It don't work that way. If you want to show relinquishing of command to God, there's a chain of events that gets there tonight. 
Amen. That's exactly right, friend. There's a relinquishing of the command in this text. Yeah. Let, me, let me just say this to your heart tonight. If you sit here and you say, Preacher, that's, that's, that's exactly right. Lord knows I want to relinquish the command of my life. I want God to have it all lock, stock, and barrel. I mean, I want God to have what I think about and what I look at and what I say. I want God to have my billfold. I want God to have my clothes. I want God to have my music. I want God to have my friends. I'm relinquishing. Look, when I'm talking about relinquishing command, I mean all of it. See, too many Christians, they just want God to take some of it. If you want God to take over, it's, it's all aspects of life. Every last bit of it. And if you're going to get God to take over, understand, please don't miss this. If you miss everything else in the message, don't miss this part. What God always says to you, what God may say to you when you decide to relinquish command, it won't always make sense to you. <laughs> You, you sit here and say, that's a good idea. I'm going to go to that altar and I'm going to say, God, hallelujah, take command of my life. And you start reading your Bible and you start praying. You know what? God will say some things to you about this stuff that you'll say, really? A lot of times what God says will not make sense. But you do it anyways because you're not in command. It don't got to make sense to you. As a matter of fact, I, I, we don't have time to read chapter 6. You know the story. You go home and read it for yourself. But chapter 6, God's going to give the battle plan to Joshua for how to beat Jericho. It's in chapter 6. It, I, I believe this conversation continues on from chapter 5 and God tells him how to whoop Jericho in chapter 6. The conversation just keeps going on and Joshua's sitting there and he says alright now Josh here's the battle plan for whooping Jericho and Joshua thinks oh yeah how, what's it going to be God? I mean is it going to be AR-15s AK-47s RPGs tanks through the door? I mean God what's it I mean you know putting it in 2020 God what's it going to be? I mean you going to rain down fire from heaven like you did Sodom and Gomorrah burn every one I'm up to a Chris. How's it going to go, God? You just give me the order, and God will carry it out. What's it going to be? And God said, all right, Josh, here it is. You ready for the battle plan? Yeah, I'm ready, Lord. Let's do it. All right, this is what I want you to do. Tomorrow, I want you to get all them killers up that you got in the camp over there. All them fellas just hungry, itching for a fight. I want you to get them all up, and I want you all to walk around that wall one time and go on back over and lay down. I'm going to get this straight, God. You want me to tell all them bloodthirsty killers I got over that's just ready to kill somebody? You want, you want me to tell them that your order is for us to just go walk around that wall and not say nothing? Just walk around the wall and then go on over and lay down. Yep, that's what I want you to do. All right, I can do that. How about day two? Day two, we're going to kill somebody, right? I mean, day two going to be blood and guts, and I mean, hacking them up and stabbing them and killing them. I mean, baking them and scraping them. I mean, we're going to get it done, God. What's day two? No, not day two. This is what I want you to do. I want you to get up, and I want you to walk around that wall and go on back over and lay down. All right. Let me get this straight in my mind. On day one, you want me just to walk around that wall. Yep. On day two, you want me just to walk around that wall. Yep. How about day three, Lord? On day three, this is real complicated, Josh, but I want you to do the same thing you did on day two and day one. Day one, you want me to walk around the wall. Day two, you want me to walk around the wall. Day three, you want me to walk around the wall. I'm starting to see a pattern here, God. Let me guess. On day four, you want me to walk around the wall. Yep. On day five, you want me to walk around the wall. Yep. On day six, you want me to walk around that wall. Yep. On day seven, now day seven, this is what I want you to do. I want you to walk around it seven times. And on the seventh time, I want you to shout because the Lord's given you the city. Did you notice something about that? Let me pause right there and preach on that for just a minute because I like it. They were to shout before the wall ever fell. They were not shouting on what God had already done. The wall was still standing. They were shouting on what they knew God could do. Let me say this, some Baptists, they won't ever start shouting until something good happens. Maybe you ought to start shouting and something good would happen. They started shouting and then the wall fell down. 
So, Lord, on the seventh day, all you want me to do is you want me to just shout and the wall's going to fall down. But all these days preceding, you want me to just walk around that God wall. Yeah. God, do you know how insane this is going to sound? I'm going to walk into the camp, look at all these guys and tell them this. Do you know what they're going to say? God, we're going to be walking around that wall and I'm going to hear people behind me saying, Boy, this ain't the way Moses did it. Well, Moses done it different than this. I think our leaders lost his nerve. If Moses was here, Moses would have done it different. God, the people on the walls are going to be looking down at us, and even our enemies are going to laugh and say, this is what we were worried about? We boarded up and, 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 and saved up to get ready for, for this? <laughs> y'all ain't got nothing. It's the best y'all got. But Joshua, it ain't got to make sense to you. You just do what I tell you to do. May I say there are many times I read my Bible. Uh, uh, brother, and when I read through that Bible and pray, I read some things that don't make sense to me. And I don't like it. And I don't even want to do it. But you know what I've found out over and over and over in my Christian life? It doesn't have to make sense to me. Me and God don't have to be on the same page and be simpatico. His ways are not my ways. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. And I've found out time and again, if I will just relinquish the command and do what he says do he'll make walls fall down in front of me the problem is nobody wants to do what he says do the problem is we want to do what we want to do and then we want God to still bless it and then act like well how come my life ain't getting blessed like their life how come God won't use me like he's using them maybe because you ain't done what he said I mean, literally, brother, preacher Foster, literally. I have watched some people, they live their life for like 20 years outside of the boundaries of that blessed old book while somebody over here has been living their life inside the boundaries for 20 years. And then this person over here finally gets right and then they get upset and bitter that they don't have what this person's already got. Why their kids ain't like their kids. Why their family ain't like their family. Why they're not advanced like this person advanced in the Christian life. Brother, there's something to consistently year after year after year submitting, serving, walking, and living for God in what He says. I got, I got a, a preacher friend down in North Carolina. He pastored in Maiden for years. He's just had to retire. He's older. Brother Charles Worley. I was preaching down in Denver, North Carolina one night. He come over to hear me, and afterwards we got talking about flying and such as that. He said, Brother Zorn, I only went flying in a little plane two times, my first time and my last time. He said, oh, just, just twice. He said, I ain't never going back. I said, what happened, preacher? He said, I got in that little plane with this fellow that I know, and we took a trip. He said, I'd been working around the church and been real busy and this and that. He said, I was tired, and the ride got a little bit long. He said, I laid my head back over, and I went to sleep. He said, next thing I know, this fellow was waking me up. And he woke me up and he said, Preacher, you better start praying. And I said, what do you mean? You better start praying. He said, you see that red light on the dashboard right there where it says landing gear and it's lit up red? He said, yeah, I see it. He said, that means the landing gear ain't coming down. I've pushed the button over and over and something has malfunctioned electronically. Preacher, I've already radioed the tower. We're going to have to belly in. We're, they're already coming out with the flame retardant stuff to spray on the runway so we don't burst into flames. Preacher, we're, we're going to have to land with no landing gear. We're going to belly in. I, I need you to pray. I need you to. I never done this before. I need you to pray. And preacher Worley said this. He said, "I'm not praying about it until we've read the manual on it." He said, "Where is the manual?" And the fellow said, "Well, it's back yonder somewhere in the back seat." And preacher turned around and looked. And brother James, he said, "They were just used oil cans and open sectional charts, and it was just a mess." He said, "I started digging through all that stuff, and finally I found the manual." He said, "When I grabbed that manual, I got to the glossary. It said landing gear. I flipped over there. I found where it was, and when I got to it, it said this: It gave troubleshooting techniques for if the landing gear does not come down automatically." 
quickly. It said there's a handle provided in the back of the seat. He said, I reached back there and I got the handle. It said, stick the handle in this little cog down underneath the dashboard. He said, I looked and found it. Stuck the handle in. It said, crank it 40 times and the landing gear will come down. The green light will come on. He said, I crunk that booger 42 times just for good measure. He said, when I crunk it 40 times, the green light on the dashboard flashed green. The light, we felt it lock in place. He said, we come around, made the prettiest landing you ever saw, and everything was fine. And I won't never forget that old preacher looked at me, and this is what he said. He said, Brother Zorn, we could have crashed and burned praying about it, or we could have just done what the manual said and had a safe landing. You know what's wrong with a lot of Baptists? They just, well, pray. I'm praying about it, preacher. Well, you, you pray for me, y'all, that I'll be able to do this. No, there's some things you ain't got to pray about. May I say sometimes praying about it, and I'm for praying, but praying about it sometimes is a smoke screen for I just ain't ready to commit and do what God said. Can I say there's some things you ain't got to pray about? Lord, help me to quit fornicating and shacking up. You ain't got to pray about that. Book already said do it. Lord, help me to quit drinking liquor and smoking. Dope. You ain't got to pray about that. Book already said not do it. Lord, I need you to speak to my heart about should I come to church on Sunday morning? Should I tithe? Should I? You ain't got to pray about that. Book already said do it. May I say tonight, if you want to see God take over, there must be a wholesale relinquishing of the command to what God said tonight. Listen to me, it's not a mystery what God said. It's right yonder in black and white. It's not like we're wandering around out here like a chicken with her head cut off. I don't know what God said. I don't know what God said. Why don't you? You got the book. <laughs> I want God to take over. Firstly, there must be a relinquishing of the command. I got to hurry. Secondly, there must be a reverence for the commander. Not only should there be a relinquishing of the command, then if we're going to see God take over, there's got to be a reverence for the commander. Look at verse 14. Watch our text here, verse 14. Uh, he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. Now watch what Joshua does when he hears this. When he hears he's the captain of the host of the Lord, Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship. Did worship... Uh, Brother Donald, why is Joshua worshiping this guy? Now, Joshua ain't no dummy. He's hung around Moses. Joshua is biblically literate. He knows about the book. He hung around with the guy who wrote the first five books of the Bible. He knows the book. You know what he knows? He knows, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. He knows you don't worship nobody but deity. You don't worship angels. You don't worship idols. You don't worship cherubims. You don't worship seraphims. You worship the Lord, and that's it. Joshua knows this. Why is Joshua worshiping him? Well, he's worshiping him for two reasons. Can I just bump one of them, and then I'll move to where I'm really going? He's worshiping him. I don't, <laughs> I don't really care what you think about this. I'm going to preach anyway. <laughs> He worshiped him because he's Jesus. You say, now, preacher. Preacher, Jesus didn't show up until Bethlehem's barn. Let me pause right there and say this. If you think the first time Jesus ever showed up was when he showed up in Bethlehem, you got a real small concept of who Jesus is. He's the one which was from old. He's the one which was from everlasting. He's the one without beginning of days nor end of days. Almighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He, he, was, he was around before he was around. He had life before he had life. He was existing before he ever started existing. Y'all get what I'm saying? And there's more to it than that. You say, that all you got? Nope. It said he, this guy's the captain of the host of the Lord. God ain't got but one captain. I, I tracked him down to Hebrews chapter 2. It ain't hard to track him down. Do a word search on Blue Letter Bible. Captain. And then just run that. It ain't hard. You, you, you know where captain will run you down to in Hebrews 2? The Bible said Jesus Christ is the captain of our salvation. 
I believe with all my heart. If, if, if Joshua had been standing next to John the Baptist when Jesus come to get baptized in the Gospel of John chapter 1, Brother Foster, I'm convinced if Joshua was standing next to John the Baptist, Joshua would have bumped John and said, Hey, John, you know who that guy is coming right there? John would have said, I sure do. That's my cousin Jesus. And more than that, he's the Lamb of God that come to take away the sin of the world. And Joshua would have said, Oh, I met that guy right there outside of Jericho one night and that right there is the captain of the host of the Lord and he just said that's impossible he just started living 33, uh, uh, 30 years ago and, and it's not possible I'm just telling you I done met that guy I met him and I know who he is he's the captain of the host of the Lord tonight he's reverencing the commander not just for who he is he's reverencing him because of what he's done you say, what has this guy... This is, you say, preacher, this is, this is the first meeting between Joshua and the captain of the host of the Lord. You're right. But Joshua realizes that he's been an unseen hand in his life. You say, what do you mean? I, won't you do me a favor? Hold your place there in Joshua 5 and run back to Exodus with me. Would you do that? Hold your finger there. We're coming right back. But go all the way to the book of Exodus. Don't miss this. Man, this is a blessing. This will help you right here. Watch what it said over in Exodus chapter 17. Now, now Joshua 5 and 6, this is Joshua's biggest battle. The battle of Jericho, the one we're reading about. That's Joshua's biggest battle. But I want you all to see something. Exodus 17, this is Joshua's first battle. The very first battle Joshua ever fights under the leadership of Moses is Exodus 17. This is number one of many. Watch what it said, Exodus 17, 8, verse 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand... Amalek prevailed. Time out. You know by verse 11, this is not merely a physical struggle. Even though there is a physical battle going on, there's more to it than that. It's a spiritual struggle. Based on the fact that every time Moses' hands go up, they win. Every time Moses' hands go down, they lose. That means there's something bigger behind the scenes helping them. <laughs> Keep reading verse 12. But Moses' hands were heavy. They took a stone, put it under him, and he sat there on. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Don't miss verse 14, y'all. It's what I brung you over here for. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book. Why, God? And rehearse it. In the ears of Joshua. So for 40 years in the wilderness, for 40 years in the wilderness, Moses has been pulling Joshua off. I don't know if it's weekly. I don't know if it's daily. But he was commanded to rehearse it. That means do it over and over. So for 40 years in the wilderness, old Moses would pull Joshua aside and he'd say, Come here, Josh. We need to talk. Moses, we've had this conversation over and over. I know, but you need to hear it because God said I need to tell it to you over and over. Now, Moses, I want uh, Joshua, I want you to read this. You remember right there when we was down there in that valley uh, of Rephidim and Amalek was a whooping you? I mean, they was whooping you good. And all of a sudden, you'd start winning, and then they'd start winning, and then you'd start winning. You know, I remember that, Moses. Now, I want you to notice something, Josh. It wasn't your sword that won you that fight. <laughs> it wasn't your strength that won you that fight, Joshua. That was an unseen hand that was down there in that valley with you. That was an unseen God that every time my hands would go up, God would give you help from another world to win that battle. Joshua, it's not you winning your battles. It's God winning battles for you, son. And fast forward 40 years to Joshua 5. Joshua's standing there, and this fellow steps up and announces himself, I'm the captain of the host of the Lord. And when Joshua hears that, he says, Great God Almighty, you're the reason I'm alive. You're the unseen warrior in all my battles. 
You, you're the one that's been helping me. You're the one that's had my back. You're the one that's gave victory when I didn't think I'd have... Bless your name. Worthy is the Lord. Thank you, Lord. And brother, if you're going to see God take over, you must get to the place where you realize this. It ain't your power. It ain't your strength. It ain't your ability. It's not your awesome Christian walk that's keeping you in this thing. But there's a God God in heaven, there's an unseen hand that when your enemies have been too big, your mountains been too high, your rivers been too wide, your valleys been too low, there was an unseen hand that was helping you tonight. You didn't make it this far on your own. There's been an unseen hand that's helped you tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. There is an unseen hand to me. And it leads through ways that I cannot see while traveling through this old world below. There's a hand that leads me. As I go, and I'm trusting to God's unseen hand that guides me through this old weary land. And some sweet day I'll reach that strand still guided by. God's unseen hand. There must be a reverence for the commander. Can I say, you know what Joshua realizes? I believe he figures something out here with this, what's going to happen between chapter 5 and chapter 6. He realizes this. If I'm going to win a battle tomorrow, I must get in his presence today. If I'm going to win tomorrow... I must worship today. Y'all know what Sunday is? It's the Lord's Day. Y'all know why we worship on Sunday. You say, yeah, that's Roman Catholic bailout tradition from Webb. No, 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 you ain't read your Bible. You ain't read your Bible. Jesus got up on the first day of the week. And they, they hey, hey, and he showed up twice on the first day of the week. Once in the morning. Once in the morning. And it was to unbelievers at that time they didn't believe. You know what Sunday morning service is? Generally it's evangelistic towards unbelievers. But he showed back up the same day in the evening to just the disciples. The disciples. He showed up on Sunday evening and that was more geared to the church. That's what a Sunday service is about. Y'all know why we have Sunday service? It's more than that. The early church met on the first day of the week. I preached last night, Acts 20, what day did it say they was meeting? First day of the week, Sunday. You know why we do that, though? It's more to it than even all that. We give God the first fruits of our week. It's just like tithing, man. We, are, we don't just tithe off our treasure. We're tithing to God off our time. We say, God, here's the beginning of my week, and it's yours. I'm giving you the first part of my week, God. You get the first part of my week. But some of y'all still ain't figured out why. You hear all that, but you still ain't figured out why. I'm going to tell you why God set it up that way. Because He knows that Monday through Saturday, out yonder somewhere at your job, in your home, at school, somewhere, there's a Jericho out there waiting on you. He knows that. Some Jericho's going to face you right smack dab in the face and you ain't going to be able to handle it. And the only thing that's going to get you through it, over it, around it, however God chooses to, is what you got on Sunday. You got in His presence on the first day of the week and it helped pull you through your Jerichos the rest of the week. You know what, you know what Sunday is? We're arming up, baby. We're getting ready for the fight. You know what He's doing on Sunday? He's giving you ammunition to fight with. 
He's taking that black bag, 66 caliber King James Bible, and you walk up in here after a week long of fighting the world, the flesh, and the devil, and son, you done shot full of holes. I mean, brother, you've chunked every spiritual grenade you got, done shot every bullet you got. You know what he's doing? He takes that Bible, and he's loading you up. He said, here's another spiritual clip. You'll, you don't know it, but you'll need that verse sometime this week. You'll need that to combat with. You get done hearing a message he preaches and thinking, man, what was the point of that? I ain't, I ain't even going through nothing like that. And then Tuesday you go through something like that. Yeah. And you know what happens? You reach in there and say, hey, he gave me something for that. God gave me something through his man for that. I got a, I got a grenade. I'm going to chunk that back at the devil. Where'd you get it from? You got it the first day of the week. And Joshua realizes if I'm going to win battles, I must reverence the commander. I'm, I'm through. That's, here's, here, here it is. We, we see it. If you want the Lord to take over, there must be a relinquishing of the command first, a reverencing for the commander second, and then lastly, we see there must be a removal of your comfort. There must be a removal of your comfort I want you to notice the first command that the captain of the Lord's host gives to Joshua. The first thing, the first command that he gives him is in verse 15. Up to this point, all he has said is, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. That's all he said. He's not given commands yet. Notice the first command he gives to Joshua is a removal of Joshua's comfort. Verse 15. And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, he said something like he said to Joshua's predecessor by a burning bush. He said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, semicolon. You say, Preacher, you really ain't fixing to start preaching the punctuation too, are you? Yeah, just for a minute I am. <laughs> I don't know what you believe about this book I'm preaching out of tonight. It really is immaterial to me. I done settled it in my heart a long time ago, and each and every day I read it, it just firmly affixes my heart towards it more and more. But I believe the book which I hold in my hand. I'm, I'm talking about the book I hold in my hand. I'm not talking about some set of manuscripts that I ain't never seen. I'm not talking about some version that just come on the scene in the last hundred years or so. I'm talking about this authorized 1611 King James Bible that I hold in my hand tonight. I am wholly taken with it. I mean, I'm, I'm, just, I, I'm just gone with it, man. I believe it's the inspired, inerrant, infallible, heaven-sent, God-breathed words of another word. I do, I do, I do. And I'm telling you, I, I, told, you, I told you I'm crazy on it now. I'm sorry. I don't just believe that the words in it are all inspired. I believe, I, brother, I've seen it too much. I even believe that the chapter and verse markations and where even the books are at got a little bit of oil from another world. I didn't say you had to believe that. I'm just telling you where I'm at on it. I'm, I'm, I'm gone on it. No, if I'm dreaming, don't wake me up. I'm enjoying where I'm at. And here it finally said, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, semicolon. I'm no English major, but I know what that means. It means there's a definite pause before the next statement comes. What is the definite pause before the next statement comes? I believe that's Joshua loosening his shoe off his foot. Loose thy shoe from off thy foot. Now, I ain't never been over here to where Jericho's at. I'd like to take a trip to the Holy Land someday. I may not get to till the millennial and the Lord can give me the grand tour, and that'll be just fine. I reckon the Lord knows more than everybody that's given tours today anyways. And uh, I, I have looked at pictures, though. This is a real rocky terrain. It ain't a place you run around barefoot at. And a military man is only as good as the base he's fighting from. You ain't never seen a soldier run off into the battlefield barefoot. He's always got his combat boots on. And the first thing God tells Joshua when he shows up, standing right there at the battlefield, he said, Joshua, give me your shoe. God, I can't fight without my shoes. I can't walk around without my shoes. God, I, I, need, I need my shoes. God said, no, Joshua, the first thing I want out of you is I want what's keeping you comfortable. You got to give me what's keeping you comfortable. You got to trust me now, Josh. Trust me. Loose your shoe. You've already worshipped me. You already know who I am. You, you're already, you already said, whatever you tell me to do, I'll do it. What, what, what's, what are you saying to your servant? I'm your servant. Servants don't back talk the Lord. Servants don't back talk the Master. What do you want, Lord? All right, this is what I want. You really want to know? I want your shoe. But God, this is going to hurt. God, 
I don't want to take my shoe off. You know how we are. Maybe Joshua didn't say it audibly. He's doing what God said, but he's doing it kind of half-heartedly. You know how we do. Joshua's loosening his shoe, and Joshua just gets it off. And Joshua's fixing to hand his shoe over. And just about that time, Joshua plants his feet on the ground and read the next part. For the place whereon thou standest is holy. When Joshua's foot hits the ground, he says, Hey, hey, it, it ain't as bad as I thought it was going to be. I thought I thought I was going to step there and I was going to say, Ow, ow, got tender feet, but I, I, Lord, this ain't so bad. God's a matter of fact, it, it feels pretty good. And the Lord said the place is holy. This place ain't holy ground, it's a battleground. Right. You realize that people's fixing to die on this piece of ground in about seven days. Yeah, yeah. This ain't holy ground; it's a battleground. But you know what I found out? I found out when God shows up, yeah. battlegrounds turn into holy ground. Yeah. Uh, hard ground turns into holy ground. Yeah. Grounds you thought was going to ruin you, ground you thought was going to take you down. That's the ground that God uses to reveal His presence and reveal His power and reveal His person. He just got to get him to a place to give him his comfort. I'll be honest, there have been some times in my Christian life where God has asked me for my shoe and I sure didn't want to give it up. There's a shoe. There's a shoe sitting on the front row over there, as a matter of fact. A little boy over there going to be 12. He's the only boy I got. Brother Harris blessed with four boys. I, and one daughter. I was blessed with three daughters and one son. He's the only boy I got. Something about a boy. To a father. And at four years old, I wasn't sure but what God was going to get him back. At four years old, he had a cancerous tumor big as my fist wrapped around his left kidney that they had to cut him from his navel to his side and take his kidney out with the tumor not knowing when the doctor come in there and told us before surgery said we, we, we're going to be honest we're not sure that how, how firm the tumor is when we start moving it and pulling it out there's a possibility it will fall apart and if it does it will send cancer cells throughout his entire abdomen that can be very dangerous <laughs> I'll never forget when they took him out of our arms and the doctor's arms and put him in the bowels and the belly to St. Joseph's Cannon Memorial Hospital and we walked into that little all-faith chapel and got to praying and begging God to touch my little boy. So I'm going to tell you what, God required my shoe. Yeah, yeah. I gave it to him. I told him in that thing, Lord, win, lose, or draw. He was yours before he was mine. I didn't like it. Right. But I'm just a servant. Right. The servant don't argue about stuff. Six months of chemotherapy later, hair falling out and everything that goes along with it. I, I'm here to tell you, God has been so good to us. He's healthy as a horse. There he sits. Look at him. Ain't nothing wrong with him. He's crazy, but he gets that from his mama. Ain't nothing wrong with him. God's been good to us. I got no sad stories to tell, and I know it could have turned out the other way, and I bless the name of God that it didn't. I know what it's like to sit there in an hour of desperation and God say, give me your shoe. And thinking to myself, God, this is going to be the toughest ground I've ever walked on in my life. God, this ground's going to hurt. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you something, friend. I walked around enough in that ground right there. You know what I ended up finding? That was the holiest ground I ever walked around on in my life. The time when he was going through all that, that was the holiest ground with God I'd ever been through. Experiencing God's peace and experiencing God's grace. Holiest ground I'd ever been on in my life. With a Jericho standing right there. Walking all around on holy ground. I remember about two and a half years ago, God, God, God had blessed and we were in full-time evangelism for well over ten years. God allowed me to finally do something for my wife that I'd always wanted to do. Uh, build her an addition onto our home in southeast Georgia. 
had just built this addition on the, to the home, uh, two-story addition off to the end of our house with her own master bedroom, big walk-in closet. My li wife likes frou-frou and shoes and makeup and all this stuff and everything. She's she, she crazy about stuff like that. She loves it. Finally built her own little place there. And, uh, you know, downstairs was my man cave. Hallelujah. It's where we... Where we where we say go dogs on Saturdays in the fall, Hallelujah. We moved into it in September of 2017, yeah, and God made me move out of it in December of 2017. <laughs> it's a church we've preached at for years up in North Carolina. Gone some trouble that year. Pastor had to leave. Church way down. And the Holy Ghost said, I want you to leave where you've lived at all your life. And I want you to go up there and pastor. I said, Lord, you don't understand. This is a ministry you gave me. I don't want a pastor. I'm happy doing what I'm doing. If I ever do pastor, I'll pastor my home church. It's five minutes from my house. <laughs> right next door to my mom and dad. Lord, I, you don't want me to do that. Yeah, I do. Brother, we packed it all up and left there. Went five hours north and started pastoring that church where God's got us at now. You say, what was that? That was God. <sighs> this is going to hurt. But if you want it, what's the servant say to the Lord? <laughs> you giving the orders. You know what I've been doing for two and a half years, though, in that place? I have been walking around slap barefoot enjoying the hound out of it. I'm telling you, I have watched God start knocking down walls over at that place. And there's still some walls standing, but I'm seeing cracks in them where God's doing something. And I've been walking around shouting the victory and saying, God, I appreciate the fact that you took my comfort because I'd have never got to this holy place had it not been for a hard place in life. And I'm saying tonight, you say, Preacher, I want God to take over. All right? I used to pray that stuff too, and I still do, but I know there's consequences for praying it now. You really want God to take over? There's not only just that relinquishing of the command, the reverence of the commander. Sometimes those are the easiest things. Sometimes the hardest thing is giving God comfort. Here's my shoe, God. But I promise you, you'll find some holy ground when you get there. Brother Cody, would you help me over here tonight? He didn't come to take sides. He came to take over. Won't you quit asking God to join up on your side? Take your side. Be on my side. Won't you just say, Lord, take my life and let it be. Consecrated Lord to thee. God, here it is. It's, it, it's all yours. Everything I got. Car, cash, clothes, family, husband, wife, kids. It's all yours. Take it. I'm relinquishing it to you, God. And I'm going to start finding out what you said in this book, and I'm going to relinquish the command of my life to you. You can have it all. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.